This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Dear ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ulrich Künker, and I have the honor to welcome you to our long table, which we dedicate today to Mark and Lottie Salton. I assume many of you did know Mark and Lottie personally, or at least you're all fam familiar with the name Salton. Um, Today, we want to talk about the history of the Salton family and as well about the uh, Salton collection itself. Um, Stackbauers and Künker are proud to be selling this fantastic collection in a series of joint, joint auction, auction sales. And as you probably know, the first sale took place in um, January 16th in uh, conjunction with the New York International conducted by Stack Bowers. And uh, the second sale will be conduct conducted by Künker uh, in March 22 in Osnabrück, Germany. So what are we going to talk about? Uh, let me see if I can, one second, please. No, 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 we are here. So I wanted to present the agenda to you and tell you what we are going to talk about today. Um, Alexandra Elflein will briefly talk about her personal memories um, of Lottie Salton. Fabian Halbig and Wicken Jakperian will tell us how the coins found their way from the um, bank bank deposit boxes to our company walls, and we'll also show some highlights from the collection, from the Salton collection. And then Dr. Ursula Kampmann will present the latest findings of her studies about the families, um, Hamburger and Schlesinger. Before I hand over uh, one comment, we, we will have time after the presentations to discuss and to um, answer questions if there, there are questions and uh, I hope so. We can discuss a little bit uh, a little longer. We will have presentations for maybe 30 minutes and then we have plenty of time to talk and discuss. But before I hand over the to Alexandra, I would like to share with you what I personally find most interesting about handling the Salton collection. First, the entire proceeds of the of the salt and sales will be going to three Jewish American organizations dedicated to never forget the Shoah. You see the, the organization listed on the slide. And second, both Lottie and Mark Salton lost everything through the Shoah caused by Nazi Germany. Despite this human tragedy caused by Germans, they decided to sell part of the collection in Germany the land of their forefathers. I am personally very pr proud and thankful for this strong symbol. Especially in the world of today, symbols are very important. That's all from my side. Please enjoy our long, long table and the upcoming presentation of my colleague Alexandra and thank you very much for joining. Alexandra, your yeah. turn. Yeah. Thank you, Ulrich, and a warm welcome to today's audience. It is wonderful to experience the great interest in the life and coin collection of Mark and Lottie Salton. We really were overwhelmed by both. First, by the beautiful and extensive collection brought together by Lottie and her husband, Mark, formerly known as Mark Schlesinger, who despite being a banker, remained a lifelong numismatist in his heart. Second, we were overwhelmed by the story of their lives, which was only revealed to us bit by bit once we started to do research. More on our surprise later, presented by Ursula Kampmann. In the little time we now have, I would love to like to talk about the 13-year-old Lottie Aronstein, which you see on the photo in the presentation in the middle. She was living in her small hometown called Bad Wünnenberg, where her big family had quietly lived and had an existence as horse dealers for generations. 
They were as their neighbors, Germans, fighting in World War I, but following Jewish ethics and religion. They were well respected and known for their charitableness. I picked this photo of Lottie and her brother, which must have been taken right before they had to leave their home in a night in November 13, uh, 30, 1938. Um, it must have been just before they had to flee as refugees for two years and eight months, possessing not more than the clothes they were wearing. Um, Lottie's word starts to break apart on May 18th, 1937, when her grandfather, Salomon Pollack, the father of her mother, Adele, commits suicide due to the increasing and unbearable anti-Jewish anti harassment of the Nazis. The shocking experience led her uncle, Adolf Pollack, to immediately emigrate to the US. This would later save Lottie's life, as well as the life of her mother Adele and her father Paul and her brother Eric. Due to her uncle already living in the US and the money he would send in 1941, Lottie and her family could pay for the ship passage and could escape Europe alive on time. I understood why Lottie and Mark decided to give the proceeds of the sale of their collection to Yad Vashem, the Leo Beck Institute, and the Anti-Defamation League when I learned more about their suffering and losses in the years of 1938 to 1941. I think it is part of the ethics they lived for. I am personally touched by the courage of Lottie, by then a 14-year-old girl, still a child. She managed to flee through Europe in war, without protection, without her parents, taking care of and feeling responsible for her younger brother, Eric. The story of the two children is heartbreaking. As Lottie tells us in her memoirs, you will find further details in our brochure. Um, you see in the presentation also on the left, a photo of the camp of Gours. It was known at the time, time as the worst camp in France. She and Eric survived the camp several months before they managed to escape and find their father in another camp in Saint Cyprien. This is shown on, on the map on the right where you can see that they had to cross France to find their father. It took again several months and another hell in a camp in Morocco until the three were finally boarding on a ship reaching New York on August 14, 1941. I've, I recently found, and it was touching, the names on the immigration lists in the archive of Ellis Island. Uh, now presented by my colleague Inya, which you don't see, she's in the background. Um, you find there um, Father Paul at 45 years, brother Eric at 12, and on another page, Lottie, 17 years. Um, and on another page, you find that the uncle Adolf Pollack was um, the relative who, yeah, who made possible for them to enter the US. So, uh, as Lottie writes, the, uh, the new life in the United States was hard. The family completely depended on the mercy of others until Lottie and her mother found a job as housekeeper to make their living. Lottie being 16 at the time. At age 24, she marries Max Solton, Max Schlesinger, the love of her life. This is my short presentation for today, uh, referring to further information in our brochure. And I'm now handing over to Fabian and Wicken. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Alexandra, and also again from my side, a warm welcome to all of you. And um, yes, so Vikan and I, and uh, with the help of uh, a lot of people and Larry Stack, not to forget to mention him, um, had uh, the pleasure and the big task to uh, sort out, well, how is this massive collection going to, for one, leave the, the vaults where it was stored and then go to uh, Stacks, go to Osnabrück, to Künker. And uh, this is obviously a big task for a big collection like this, but uh, in COVID times, it was a, a very big task. So uh, to, to, to first of all start off, uh, we really were incredibly, incredibly grateful for uh, Vicken and his team and Stax Bowers as our partner, because at the time in Europe, we were not allowed to enter the United States. We could not legally uh, come to the US, there was a travel ban. So we had to rely on, on just the, the inventories that uh, were, were done with an expert team there and, and Vicken's team and everybody that worked together to get the collection sort of from the vaults to Stax Bowers where they had to work. So this was already um, in all of this long process of, 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 of the lives of the Sultans and, the, and, and, and getting the collection together. One last step, which was also uh, a little bit as of sort of the big journey, uh, uh, not an easy one, but um, with the help of Stax Bowers, we uh, were able to get the coins um, sorted out and had them arrive uh, to Osnabrück. And you can see here in the photo, uh, Mr. Ulrich Künker and Mr. Fritz Rudolf uh, and by the uh, smiles on their faces, I think you can tell that we were quite relieved that all of the coins finally made it, or the, the portion that we're selling finally made it here. Um, I will just very quickly uh, talk about um, just the highlights that um, we will be having in the sale where, like Ulrich mentioned, the first sale that took already place in New York and our second sale is coming up in March and we will be selling um, European gold coins and medals. Um, I will just would like to present two quick pieces to you um, because I think uh, a lot of you are interested a lot of in the history and but I just want to point out two um, two lots, uh, which is the first lot is number 1280 1280 if you want to uh, look it up later. Um, it's an amazing interesting huge uh, gold coin for the time weighing over 60 grams, which is quite unheard of for this time period. Um, this piece is from the city of Kampen, which in, is in today's Netherlands, and it's an eight rose noble or quadruple sovereign, as uh, um, Mr. Mr. Salton called in his in, in his inventory. And um, if you look on the picture, you can, if you are familiar with history and how 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 royals are portrayed, you might notice and go, wait a minute, this does not look like a Dutch coin at all. This looks like an English coin, because you can see Elizabeth on there. And this is also uh, how sort of uh, today's world and, the, and this world is uh, connected. Today we can pay with uh, a euro in France, in, in, in Germany, and in a lot of countries. And at this time, trade was incredibly important. And the trade between the countries, especially the low countries in English, was quite strong. So this coin or this, 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 this design was represented or respected in these two countries. So basically what happened is that they made an imitation of an English coin in Kampen. Um, but usually this coin would weigh seven grams gold. This coin weighs 60 grams gold, so it's quite heavy. And it's incredible to think about how a piece like this survived from when it was made 1600s. It was not made into other coins or jewelry or just for the pure gold value of its time. Um, that these coins were melted down, unfortunately, was a lot of times the case for a lot of big gold coins that are now lost. And in fact, this exact coin almost had that fate. Um, this coin was in an auction and then basically traded back and forth and was still in the possession of Mark Salton. And then um, in the time when uh, the Netherlands were invaded by Germany, by Nazi Germany, um, and the Sultans unfortunately had to flee again. Um, these gold coins were kept or were taken away by, um, by the Nazi, Nazi government and were stored in the Dutch National Bank. And this piece was supposed to be melted down for its pure gold value at the time. Um, luckily, through the intervention of Jack Schulman, uh, another dealer in, 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 the, in, in the Netherlands, this piece was saved and uh, is now available for us to cherish and hopefully will be in another collection for a long period of time. A second piece I would just like to quickly point out to you is lot 1628 on our sale. It's a big gold coin from Germany. As Ulrich said, it's quite, quite incredible that Mark uh, and Lottie with all of her history 
a big part of this collection is German gold coins, um, had still, you know, cherished German gold coins, even if they had such a terrible sort of life experience with their country of origin. And uh, this coin, the reason I just chose that is to point out that a lot of times coins are sort of not seen as artistic or as artistic as popular art culture. But if you look at the view of the city of Regensburg, I'm not sure if anybody of you has been there, but it looks exactly like it looks still today with the bridge over the Donau and there's a little nice restaurant at the, at the end, which is still existing today. And uh, it's, it's very artistic in my opinion, at least. And in my opinion, it just shows that coins can be a great source of uh, monetary history, but also artistic uh, pieces. Uh, Vic and I would now love to um, sort of go over to you um, because uh, uh, I'm, it's not gonna end there with the Sultan pieces. Um, you guys having uh, the next sale coming up in August. And I would just love to uh, thank you again for all the work you've done. And we are very happy to do this with you. Th thank you, Fabian. You guys have been great partners uh, in, this, in this auction process here, which you know, started out with, with uh, Mark and Lottie's uh, very, very uh, acute collecting over, over many, many decades. I mean, the, the knowledge that went into building the collection uh, I guess, other than uh, Ira and and Ira Rizak and Alan Stahl, who were trustees of, of the the Sultan Estate and who did the initial inventorying of the collection, I mean, they must have had great fun looking at these coins, which I'm sure they had heard about over the years, as as we all did. Um, you know, I the legend of Mark and Lottie came to me from from uh, uh, Harvey and Larry Stack, and they the Sultans were always a revered name at, at 123 West 57th Street, where, where our main offices were for, for almost 70 years. Um, so to, then finally, you know, decades after first hearing the, the Sultan name to be able to hold these coins in hand was, was really special. And I think Ulrich hinted at it, but the, the collection overall it was quite huge. And when, when we finally got it into our offices here and, and with sadness, we weren't able to have Kunker uh, come and join us in, in the division of the collection because the Sultans had had chosen both Stacks and 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 uh, Kunker to to auction the collection uh, upon their passing. Um, you know, I we here had to translate the collection, which was on paper, uh, but with eight or nine thousand individual pieces, it would have been impossible to to, to transmit that information. Uh, to, to Germany in order to, to work on the division of the collection, um, you know, coin by coin. So we had, we had decided upon dividing the collection by certain categories where much of the European coinage, both gold and silver was going to be sold in Germany by, by our partners Kunker and uh, part of Europe, including uh, Russia, Poland, uh, Great Britain and, and Commonwealth, as well as U.S. coins and Asian coins, were going to be sold by Stax Bowers in the United States. So, the the division was was a huge job and and quite fun. I mean, there were so many coins that I had never heard of before. For example, the Compen piece when I first uh, poured that coin out of its uh, two by two envelope, I was stunned. I, I had no idea what it was. As as Fabian hinted, it looks like a, a fine sovereign of Elizabeth I of England, but it's so much thicker and weightier and, and just very impressive in hand. And to hold that unique piece, I don't, I don't think I'll ever forget it for the rest of my career. Um, but it was extremely fun going through all these coins that, that I'm sure some of them, some of them had not been uh, touched in, in many years or decades um, or that had been in, in their envelopes for many years and decades and had pedigrees going back 100 years or more in, in, in many cases. So it was a, a very fun uh, to work with those coins. Um, and we have a few highlights here, which we'll be selling. A Fabian hinted that we'll be continuing the, the Sultan tradition in our August auction. There, there are a couple of small- um, Famous coin collector couples. I'm sorry? Um, I, I think that was just someone unmuted. I muted them. Sorry, oh, continue. Gotcha. Okay, sorry about that. And. Um, we do have uh, British coins, in English and, and Great Britain coming up, as well as some Latin American coins in our August auction. But between now and then, we'll also have some, some US coins in our April auction. 
uh, April Baltimore auction, as well as uh, some uh, selections of Asian coins, chiefly Chinese coins, in our Hong Kong auction uh, at the beginning of May. So just moving towards the, the highlights we have here, there are many, several hundred uh, British and Latin American coins, but I just selected four, which we'll just uh, scroll through as, as some eye candy. The first piece here is a, is a gold pound of Elizabeth. I, I love this coin just because of the portraiture. It's not quite modern. It's not quite medieval. Um, and this, this piece is quite uh, in quite a, a fine state of preservation for one of these. Uh, no major flaws or, or, or um, you know, crimping uh, or creasing on this piece. Uh, just, a, uh, just a wonderful type coin, uh, just a wonderful example of the type. Uh, if we can go to the next uh, slide. This is a beautiful five guineas of, of William III. Um, fine work, uh, fine work, five guineas as they call it. Uh, this this coin is a mint state piece, I believe, graded by PCGS as MS61. Uh, all of these large uh, gold coins are so impressive. We're, we're kind of inured to huge gold coins today. It seems like every minor country is 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 minting enormous size gold coins, but but in in its day, this was one of the largest gold coins minted. Uh, this piece is interesting in that if you look uh, going from William's, uh, I guess, neck down to, to about the six o'clock position on the, the obverse, you see a, a crack there. It was just uh, during the striking the, to bring out the, the fullness of the designs. Uh, I guess this, the planchet just kind of cracked under the weight of the, the pressure of the dies. Um, but just one of my favorite pieces in, in the collection, in the, in the collection of British. We can go to the next one. This one of, of this type I've always uh, been attracted to. This is a 1837 in quotes uh, a pattern crown made by uh, struck by Thomas Pinches. It was uh, struck in the 1890s, and and it's hard to tell from the image, but this this private pattern is is actually an incus design. I guess presaging the the designs of of Bella Lyon Pratt here in the United States. The the five dollar gold two and a half and five dollar gold pieces. Uh, that started in 1908 uh, by, I guess, predating them by about 15 years, but just a, a very uh, modern design, which is which is um, a little jarring when, when you look at the date on the coin of 1837, but but made in the 1890s. Uh, a coin, I believe, that was made in about an addition of 200 pieces, and they do come up on occasion, but this is a, a nice choice on circulated example. If we can uh, go to the next piece. And uh, this again is one of my favorites. Uh, Fabi and I and I were joking about it earlier today. It's a gold striking of a, of a, I wouldn't say common, but they do come up occasionally in silver of a of a Bolivian proclamation medal of, of Bolivar 1825. It shows a, a Cerro de Potosí, the, the Mount of Potosí, where um, millions of pounds of uh, of silver were extracted by indigenous. Uh, and uh, indigenous labor over centuries. Uh, I've, I've never been there. I think uh, Fabian has, so maybe he'll comment on it later. But I remember seeing images of, of the pockmarked mountain or, or uh, mountain full of tunnels uh, of silver in, in National Geographic as, as a child. And to, to hold this gold medal, I don't know if it's unique, but it, at least extremely rare. And I'm sure with the way the Latin American market has been doing lately, with, uh, I'm sure we'll get lots of uh, great bids and great eyes. So uh, that's all for today. If uh, you have any questions at the end, I'm happy to, to field anything. And uh, with that, I, I'll yield the floor. Great, Vic, and thanks a lot. Yes, I indeed have been there, and it's quite impressive to see the, 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 the silver mine. Also quite sad if you think about all the lives lost for mining silver and gold in Potosí, but very impressive. Um, we are now coming to the uh, final and sort of uh, keynote part of this uh, this this little talk that we that, that, that we're having tonight. Um, and I would love to uh, hand you over to uh, Mrs. Dr. Ursula Kampmann, who has been over the last what has it been? Or she maybe six months has been really studying the history of not only the Schlesinger family and the Salton family, but um, the effects and not only the effects, but the history of the German coin trade itself, because as it is 
happening, yeah. um, and Mrs. Kampmann will tell you, um, the Schlesinger family is not just on its own impressive in terms of the German coin trade, but was part of the beginning of the German coin trade. Um, so we're quite happy that she took all this time to really go into this really historic uh, uh, research and, and dove deep. And uh, I'm quite interested to see what she found out. And uh, uh, I will hand you over to her. Thank you very much, Fabian. I'm really happy to share my researches on the Hamburger and Schlesinger families with all these coin enthusiasts who are sitting there. And I'm very grateful to Künker that they were willing to finance this research. I'm also grateful to a lot of, uh, to all those who helped me. And I've seen at least two of them here at this meeting, Ira and David, thank you very much for your help. It was very much appreciated. So I would love to go into all the details, but we've got a slight problem. And this problem is named time. I've got 10 minutes for about 200 years and about 40 biographies. You see, there's no chance to live up to this challenge. Therefore, I have restricted myself to three main topics. First, I would like to demonstrate the quality of the sources I was able to use. They give us glimpses of the characters of our protagonists. I will demonstrate that with my two favorite stories. The second part of my presentation will be a quick tour of the Hamburger Schlesinger family tree, showing how close the various coin dealers were interconnected. And if there's still enough time, I will offer an insight into the social aspects of the coin trade. I always wondered why the German coin trade of the 19th century was dominated by Jewish families. And I think I can come up with a logical answer. So let's start with part one. We are lucky that the touching memories of four members of the Hamburger and Schlesinger families have survived. Which kind of stories they tell? Here are two examples. And they are not related to the coin trade, but to the personalities of coin dealers. My favorite coin dealer is Felix Schlesinger. And I'll tell you why. Felix was a war hero. And I'm not talking about his Iron Cross or the fact that he served from the very first day of World War I. I'm talking about an episode that happened a few days after the end of World War I. Just imagine, the emperor had just resigned. There was no government, no authority. In a nutshell, it was a time a sensible person stayed at home. Then Felix Schlesinger was in Poland, in Poland, in Posen. There he learned that his brother-in-law was in danger of starving to death at a prison in Münster. He has not the time to tell in detail why this man was in prison. Of course, his family was convinced he was innocent. So what did Felix Schlesinger do? Remember, he was a soldier. He dressed in full uniform and asked two comrades for help. Together, they traveled more than 700 kilometers through an archaic country whose infrastructure had totally collapsed. He knocked at the prison gate and told the people responsible that he was in charge and that he was going to take the prisoner with him. And he did so. He risked his own life to rescue his brother-in-law from starvation. And what is even more in my opinion, he was able to motivate two other men to risk their lives too in order to rescue that innocent man. What a hero, what a leader. 
His son, Max Schlesinger, aka Mark Salton, seems to have taken after him. Let's tell one of his stories, and maybe you know already part of it from the ANS magazine. It's May 10, 1940, late evening. The Germans have crossed the border to invade the Netherlands. The Dutch government imposes a curfew in order to make it harder for German agents to carry out attacks. And at the apartment of the Schlesingers, Mama Schlesinger suffers a serious heart attack. No telephone to call a doctor, no public transportation, no street lights, only heavily armed soldiers going on patrol in the dark. And what does Max Schlesinger do? He gets on his bicycle in order to fetch a doctor. Of course, a Dutch patrol catches him. Max is blonde. He speaks Dutch with a German accent. What would you think if you were a Dutch soldier looking out for German spies? They threatened to shoot him. Fortunately, some superior came by with him by chance an Orthodox Jew. He challenged Max to prove his story by quoting a part of the Bible in Hebrew. Max did so, and the officer called a military vehicle to bring him to the doctor and a doctor to his mother, and so she survived. That was Max Schlesinger. He was the last member of a dynasty who can be traced back up to the 19th century when Jantuf and Löb Hamburger were still working as court Jews in the Hanau ghetto. And I hope that we can show that uh, with uh, the cursor, but I'm afraid you have to follow, follow, ah, yes. So can you show Jantuf and Löb, please? So Löb Hamburger had three sons who witnessed the Jewish emancipation. This event tore many families apart. There were those who were willing to assimilate and to give up at least a few of the 613 mitzvot. And of course, there were other Jews who were not willing to do so. So the uh, Hamburger family was divided. Joseph and Julius belonged to the reformed Jews. Jacob was Orthodox. Joseph and Jacob partnered in conducting a wholesale family. When the railroad disrupted, uh, disrupted their business model, the company failed because Jacob was not willing to waive the Sabbath commandment. Due to these financial problems, Leo the Elder had to serve whatever apprenticeship was offered to him without due. You see, Leo was the son of Joseph. I hope you can see him in the, in the family tree. So Leo went to Munich where the Orthodox banker Samson Oberndorfer and his Orthodox the Orthodox brother-in-law Abraham Merzbacher had a bank house and coin dealerships in Vienna and Munich. Leo was attracted to orthodoxy and thus he won the support of his masters. They introduced him to their acquaintances. Among them, the Orthodox Feuchtwanger family who would supply the wife of his cousin Leo the Younger and of Felix Schlesinger. In 1863, Leo Hamburger established himself as coin dealer at Frankfurt. He partnered with an old acquaintance from the Hanau ghetto, the Bear family. And he did them the favor to take in their son-in-law, Adolf E. Kahn, for an apprenticeship. And I guess all of you are familiar with the name Kahn. There might be even another coin dealer hidden in this family tree. One of the daughters of Julius, the brother of Joseph and Jacob, married 
and Adolf Hess, which could be the founder of the Hess coin dealership. I can't prove it yet, but also there's no argument against it. Leo's coin dealership fed many family members who worked for him. Among them, his son, Joseph, his brother, Adolf, and his cousin, Leo the Younger. When Leo the Younger married Meta Feuchtwanger, bringing him an impressive dowry, he bought himself into the coin dealership of Leo Hamburger the Elder as a partner. When Leo Hamburger the Elder died in 1902, Leo Hamburger the Younger took over the company. That brought a lawsuit with Leo's son, Joseph, who also wanted to run the company. It was finally settled with a compromise. Joseph received the house of his father where the company used to be located and where he located his new coin company. Leo the Younger was awarded the stock as well as the library, but had to move his company. Both of them continued to conduct their own business. In 1904, Siegmund, the only son of Leo Hamburger the Younger, and you will see him here. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Uh, this poor man committed suicide. Uh, it was said due to uh, a love that ended in unhappiness. Nevertheless, Leo had to find a successor. As one son-in-law was not interested and his employee and other son-in-law, David Nussbaum, proved to have no business sense at all, he took in Felix Schlesinger. Felix was the son of Leo's widowed so uh, sister Röschen. Could you show him, please? So he was the son of Röschen and Max Schlesinger. And his father had died and uh, didn't leave any seed money as a heritage to Felix. So this was Felix's chance. He married Hedwig Feuchtwanger and her dowry and invested the dowry to become Leo's associate. After World War I and the following hyperinflation, the Hamburger coin dealership was more or less bankrupt. Therefore, Felix Schlesinger left for Berlin where two sisters and his wealthy brother-in-law were living. There, he built up his own coin dealership until German law made it impossible for a Jew to operate a coin dealership. He left for Amsterdam with his books. He had to give up all assets at the bank, but received his coins after several months. So thus, he was able to start a new coin dealership, as did his son, Max Schlesinger. This ended with the German capture of the Netherlands. While Max Schlesinger could escape, his father and his mother were murdered in the gas chambers of Auschwitz. Max Schlesinger survived World War II and emigrated to the United States where he found his wife Lottie and a job. In order to make some extra money, he founded a coin dealership but when he became one of the top managers of the manufacturer's Hanover Trust Company, he gave up dealing in coins and became a coin dealer instead. That's, in a nutshell, the story of the Hamburger and Schlesinger family. And I have to confess that I hate it. I absolutely hate it to omit all those wonderful anecdotes which would have made these facts much more interesting. Nevertheless, let's come to the last part. I will try to answer the question, 
why the German coin trade was dominated by Jews in the 19th century. In order to answer that question, we need to remember that after the emancipation, there was a heated discussion how to keep Jewish identity while earning one's living. For all of those who were orthodox and wanted to keep all of the 630 mitzvot, any dependent employment was impossible. While many professions required customer-oriented opening hours, a coin dealership was a very good way of reconciling a religious life with a profitable business model. Second, the Orthodox community seems to have been very supportive within their own community. My research showed that many German coin dealerships were headed by Orthodox Jews who were closely connected either by joint origin, by kindredship, or by marriage. Those who were not were offered their apprenticeship often as a charity. Those who proved clever and hardworking were supported to open their own coin dealership as, for example, Leo Hamburger. Third, in the 19th century, the coin business was all about capital. You couldn't run a coin shop without the money to buy collections. Therefore, the dowry was of fundamental importance. In the 19th century, wedding traditions changed. While in the rest of society, it became normal that people married out of love. The Orthodox community continued the institution of arranged marriages. The dowry gave a bright Orthodox coin dealer enough capital to run his coin dealership or to become an associate. And the family of his bride had, of course, the guarantee that their son-in-law would be able to sustain his family. Okay, that's it. I hope I could pick your curiosity. There's an English version of the Künke Brochure. There's a film too. There's plenty of material to know more about the fascinating fate of the Hamburger and Schlesinger families. So I hope you will start to read the brochure and thank you for the attention. Excellent, thank you so much. This was fantastic. This was such a great talk and, uh, and so many different ways to, to look at the stories of of these families and, and the objects uh, that come out of, of the collection. So we have plenty of time for questions or about 20 minutes for, for questions and further discussions. I know that plenty of people here either knew them personally um, or uh, are familiar um, with some of these stories and we were able to dive a little, a little deeper. Um, but if anyone has questions, you can unmute yourself or you could put your questions in the chat and I'm happy to, uh, to read out anything um, if, you, if you don't wanna to speak uh, yourself. Perhaps we should end uh, sharing uh, the screen so uh, we can see each other a little bit better. Uh, yes, just give me one second. Thanks again also Ursula for all the for all the work you have put in over the last months and it was quite fascinating, interesting and uh, and, uh, and 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 uh, just an incredibly family history and that you can combine that a lot of times in our industry i think a lot of times you don't have enough time unfortunately to dive really deep into the objects that you're dealing with and that we have now had that opportunity in this case and that you did the work on that part we're extremely grateful and i think it just shows the incredible history of the sultan collection and um, and and of the sultan schlesinger family and uh, we are very fortunate to to now present this to you um, in the audience. So yeah, we are just uh, waiting for if there's any questions and are more there's than happy. One, to there's them. one question here in the chat and I've got somebody with their hand raised. So I'll read out the question and then um, we'll move to the to the hands. Uh, so there's a question that um, how, how were they able to get the library out to the US or how much of it was assembled or reassembled um, in, in the US? 
Um, I Ursula? Think, hmm? I think uh, the best person uh, would, uh, uh, would be David to answer the question because he has done uh, most, of, uh, most of the research on, uh, on the reinstitu uh, restitution and I could just uh, sum up what he has uh, written about it. So I know you are not prepared, but David, might I give you the word because you are the one and only who has done that. Well, Hi, you, you, you put me on the spot there if you're talking to me. Um... No, I'm talking to David Hill. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I also can sum up a little bit, but I think you have done the research, so, so it would be on you. Yes, well, I mean, we're happy here at the uh, American Numismatic Society. I'm the librarian and archivist at the American Numismatic Society, and we are happy to have gotten um, the Mark and Lottie Sultan papers. So I was able to go through them, and um, as Ursula mentioned, write a little bit about their history. And um, I want to thank everybody for this presentation, for their presentations today. I mean, this is all very enlightening. Um, yes, there was quite a bit in the papers about the library and Mark's efforts over the years to uh, get uh, books back that were taken from his father. Um, a lot of very specific correspondence there. Um, however, the library itself, um, yeah, I I'm not too clear. I, I had done some, um, I went with uh, Norman Pepin to the Sultan apartment and to get the papers themselves. So by that point, I think the library wasn't at the apartment anymore. So I'm not familiar with the books that, uh, you know, decades later that they still had. Um, but I know a lot of the papers, one, one of the interesting things was the, the, they had these um, Nazi directive documents in the papers. And, you know, as an archivist, when I see these things, um, these are original documents. So these are not copies. I mean, he, he would have copies of documents from uh, his uh, from Mark's research of trying to, um, you know, get back what had been taken from him. Um, but some of these were original documents. So whenever I see original documents uh, out of context for me as an archivist, I'm thinking, where did these come from? But, uh, you know, somewhere along the way in the correspondence, I read that uh, Mark's brother had, you know, when, once he went back and he had, he had gone to Palestine, once he had came, come back into the offices, a lot of these papers were still there, a lot of uh, memoranda and this sort of thing. Um, and so I will say that we got... Uh, papers uh, from the sultans. And um, so we have about 20 cubic feet of papers, but we don't have really uh, the library. So that's kind of a summary. Um, yes, if I can jump in there quickly, I mean, the library, and I saw David Funning was just joining in for a sec, the library was uh, uh, subsequently also sold as basically the first part, let's not forget that, <laughs> the first part of the Sultan sales was actually the library, which was sold at Corbin Funning, and um, that part um, uh, was the library that, in, if, if, if I'm not mistaken, was basically at the Sultans or at the Schlesingers and then was subset, sub, subsequently um, trying to rebuild that old library. I think Marx sort of, he was trying to rebuild that old library that was in existence. And that was the library at the end that was um, that was there as his, as his working library on coins. And that was then now sold at Colvin Funding. That's, that's, I think, my understanding. I'd like to add one thing in the, um archive that the Sultans preserved, there's an original copy of Felix's listing of his library and the approximate values that he put on the books that he had before the library was seized. And I think that that exists, David, among the papers. Yeah, um, there's actually uh, an appraisal that was done. Uh, by another appraiser. We also have uh, Al B. Your hand is up here if you want to unmute and ask your question. Yes, thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate this talk. And um, I wonder if you could comment about um, the remarks you made about the early German dealers. I've been researching 
some of the 19th century Berlin dealers. And I wonder if you could comment about whether the, um, uh, the influence of uh, Jewish orthodoxy uh, extends to all of the other uh, the German dealers, particularly the Berlin dealers, Adolf Weil, the Jungfer brothers, etc. cetera. Um, if you could comment on that, I'd appreciate it. And thank you again for a very informative talk. I think that's on me to answer. Uh, I have to tell you that um, I was restricted doing research on the Hamburg and Schlesinger family. So I concentrated on that without going on to all the German de uh, coin dealer, which would be uh, much, much too much for this uh, brochure. And um, I was restricted by um, the job I got from Künke, uh, researching the Hamburger Schlesinger family. I just realized when I did that, that I had so many orthodox dealers and I realized all these connections to other Jewish dealers. And I think now research has to go on uh, in order to find out that the hypothesis that I have made after this research can be proved by further research. It's just as I told you, it's a suggestion. It's uh, something I watched. We have to prove that now on other families. I was not able to do this research yet, but I think it's, um, it would be quite interesting to do this and to see whether this really holds, uh, holds true. Well, thank you very much. And I certainly would encourage that research to go on. It's not been easy finding information about these folks. Uh, but again, thank you very much for an excellent talk. I, I think we have to, what we have to do is doing the genea genealogic, um, the genealogy of all these uh, coin dealers, because I got the, uh, the impression that when you look long enough, you will find a connection. It's a, it's a completely different approach to the history of coin dealing. And uh, it's a very new approach because normally we just uh, look for the names, we look when were they were, what were the collect, uh, collections they sold. Uh, we never have, there is no social research on coin dealers families yet. And so that's a completely new question I was presenting to you. It's just the beginning. Yeah, and you, and you find contradictions in the obituaries too. Um, I've had that uh, unfortunate experience where one obituary will say one thing, another one will say uh, something else. And um, I, I have found actually some of the city directories to be quite interesting because in those days, the city directories listed some of their occupations. And so you could get some insight into where they were and maybe other businesses that they were engaged in. Um, it, it's tenuous, but, um, but it's been very helpful. Well, uh, lots of room for research here. Thank you again. Um, thanks for the questions in the chat also. And of course, you, you are more than welcome to download the catalogs. Uh, you'll find them in very different formats via issue, Google Books, um, on our website. And uh, thanks, Emma. She provided the link in the chat. Um, and then if you go on our website, you can just go to catalog to auctions and to catalogs and you can just download it there, of course. There's also another note here um, from David Fanning um, about uh, some work that's been done on the biographies of 19th century German coin dealers, um, and he provides the, uh, uh, the bibliography uh, note there. Does anyone else have any other questions um, or, or conversation points to add to, to this discussion? Yeah, I'd like to wonder if Gertrude Tulle who is on this call is willing to talk about Lottie Salton's hometown because she has written 
a history of the Jews in the town that Lottie came from. So I wonder, Gertrude, if you were willing to say a few words about that. You have to unmute yourself, though, to do it. Thank you very much, Ira. So I see you once. We only have a contact by email until right. now. Uh, you know, I'm um, very ill in time and I try to speak English, but I'm not prepared for this situation. Yes, I've um, begun in uh, 2010, about the time I've tried to um, search about uh, the Jewish uh, people who lived in our little town. And so I have uh, found um, in the last uh, century, I found something about the Aronstein family. And I was very interested in it. And my aunt had a connection to um, Lottie from, from the child, uh, from the, when they were child. And so I have connected her by telephone. And I had uh, the time, yes, when she was 90 until her death. I connected her from time to time, and it was by Lottis that I um, made your connection also. Your, uh, <laughs> yes, you, I've written a little book, but um, uh, it is a wonderful only... book. A wonderful <laughs> book, and I've used it a lot, and it, it was wonderful to use it because it spared a lot of time for me. So thank you very much for all the research you've done. Thank you very much. I was very interested when I began, I couldn't stop. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, there are a couple of other questions here, just if the, um, if the print catalogs of the auctions will be available. I guess this is from for uh, Fabrizio. Uh, yes, I'll also just uh, uh, provide an email address in the chat um, that if you would like to get a printed version, um, just go ahead and email us um, and, uh, and, and also we can provide you if there's difficulties with downloads or something um, on one of the slides before we had the QR code where you can download the brochure. Um, so that's also available for download. Um, and to browse through that, just to, just give us a just just give us an email and uh, and we'll, uh, we'll 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 stay in touch. Uh, I'll add to that if any of the upcoming stacks Bowers auctions that include salt and coins. If anyone needs one of those catalogs, reach out to to either me directly at Stacks Bowers, F Fabian, or anyone at either of our firms, and we'll we'll make sure you guys get catalogs. Uh, I will add that um, we did sell the ancient Greek, the first portion of the ancient Greek coins that was uh, that was salt and one, as uh, Ulrich had mentioned earlier in the in the discussion, we'll be continuing some of the, the ancient Greek uh, later this year or early next year as well. Um, so just some other things to look forward to other than other than the British Latin American US, etc, that we'll be selling on, on this side of the, of the Atlantic. And then um, there's a question, uh, Fabrizio, if you want to ask yours out, or I can read it here. Uh, it's, uh, is, there, is there also a collection of medals formed by uh, Mark and Lottie Salton? Um, and I'm assuming that's uh, if there's a kind of a catalog or a kind of comprehensive notes on, on the medals. Yeah, I can, I can speak to that. The Sultans were very serious metal collectors, particularly medals of the Renaissance. They published a catalog in 1965 at the time that their Renaissance medals were exhibited at Bowdoin College in Maine. And that catalog is available, I think, through David Fanning, uh, through Colby and Fanning. Um, it listed about 165 Renaissance medals, all of which have been donated by the Sultans at no charge to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and have been transferred there. Excellent. 
Excellent. Excellent. Well, if there are no further questions, I want to thank all of our speakers. I mean, this was this is such a dynamic and interesting talk about um, uh, about both the families and the um, and the objects in in the collection. Uh, just to announce that next week um, we'll have um, uh, Scott Miller, one of uh, the ANS fellows, present a discussion on uh, the introduction to the function and design of metals. Um, and we're really looking forward to that. That'll also be next Friday at the same time, at 1 p.m. Eastern time uh, or um, different times around the world. But we look forward to seeing you on for that next week. Uh, and we'll send out the email per usual um, with, with that uh, announcement on, on Monday for next Friday. Thank you all. And we really appreciate it. Thank you very much for your end. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.